uh, city of Gresham, Sacramento, California, Washington, Vancouver. So it looks like we've got people joining from a variety of places. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, so today we're really excited because we've got a special guest speaker. Thanks so much for joining us, Jacob Shockey. Jacob is joining us. He's the executive director and co-founder of the Beaver Coalition, in addition to have, uh, being a professional wildlife biologist. So he's very knowledgeable on the topic of beaver and what that looks like to cohabitate with beaver for a better future for all of us. So uh, with that, I'm actually just gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Jacob. Thanks so much for coming today. And um, he's gonna go ahead and start presenting. If you have questions as we're going, throw those in the Q&A box on Zoom or on Facebook Live in the comments. Thanks. Great, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, before I get going, uh, just a shout out to my co-founder, Rob Walton says hi. He is uh, from Johnson Creek Watershed Council uh, territory. So I'm speaking to you from the Beaver Coalition, and uh, he was my partner in getting this going. As an overview, uh, I will lead in with a bit of an introduction today on myself and how I got involved with Beaver. We'll go through sort of the keystone role that Beaver play in ecosystem function. We'll talk about the historical context of Beaver on our landscape. We'll move from there into um, a focus on resolving conflicts, human conflicts with Beaver. Uh, through natural science and design, I found uh, that's usually how we interact with beaver. And um, as we get into the comments, if folks want to talk in more depth about uh, beaver-based restoration, I'm happy to do that too. But I'll, I'll then focus into um, coexistent strategies with beaver and we'll talk about a strategic path forward. So before we plow in, uh, Tiffany, would you mind putting up the first poll? We'll get a little bit of an idea as to where folks are at. So yeah, that poll should be up right now. You should see it on your screen. And if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead and put in the comments um, what your level of knowledge is with beavers. Are you a newbie? Do you have some knowledge, some experience, or expert? You could comment that on there. Great, so I'll leave this up for another few seconds. So go ahead and vote. Cool, thank you all. Looks like uh, some experience is definitely winning out. So that's great. We'll uh, cater this talk to that. And please feel free to hit me up with questions afterwards too if I glossed over something or used a ridiculous acronym or what have you. Alrighty, thank you. <clears throat> so an introduction, uh, I am from Southwestern Oregon. I'm down in the Applegate Valley, uh, right along the Siskiyou Mountains uh, that divide Oregon and California. I grew up on the land. I was a skeptical kid watching my parents plant trees and uh, now I'm the father of three uh, who just as skeptically watching the plant trees. And I've spent my professional life thus far in this alphabet soup of logos. Uh, when we talk restoration, we talk, there's multiple um, places people are coming from and we're all kind of working together uh, to get good projects on the ground. Uh, if you were to draw a line around those groups, you would have roughly speaking, the nonprofit agencies that are often implementing restoration work you have the funders that are often funding restoration work. Uh, you have private contractors who are doing the restoration work on the ground, and then agencies who are supporting and directing and buying off on. And much of my um, last seven, eight years, I managed a restoration program for Watershed Council, the Applegate Partnership, and we did a lot of the typical Watershed Council y stuff. So we put large woody debris in streams for fish habitat. We found these abandoned dams across the landscape and worked to remove them with the landowners. We took uh, monocrops of invasive plants and tried to, uh, to turn those into more complex, diverse habitats um, for, through invasive species removal and planting. And if you were to distill all that down, what we're trying to do is some action that leads to habitat. Uh, often it's because some, some piece of habitat is limiting, in the case of watershed councils on the west side of our state, 
you know, we're very focused on the limiting factors for coho specifically. So uh, often we're looking at what habitat is limiting for coho. Great, let's do some human action to uh, try to make that habitat. And the problem is it hasn't been working as well as folks had hoped. Uh, habitat's often the result of a process and uh, over the last number of years, uh, this idea of process-based restoration has been gaining hold as those of us in the restoration practitioner field have noticed that our projects that we built to look like habitat don't actually function like habitat. So um, as we've gone out and we've created what we see when we think functional habitat, uh, that often falls apart or gets covered in invasive species or isn't maintained. And um, that's been a frustration and you know a lot of money has been spent so we get at this idea of, okay, uh, some, some habitat process isn't, isn't working. What is, the, what is the thing that humans can do that pushes it over the edge that, that, that um, addresses the tipping point to where uh, that habitat can, can promote itself and, and be self-maintaining uh, into the future, that it can be actual habitat. And that's when beaver come into the picture. And as we'll get into, uh, beaver results in, the, in a whole number of habitats for um, really any species that co-evolved to the wetlands of, of the northern hemisphere. Beaver have been uh, selfishly for their own, their own purposes uh, engineering and maintaining habitats across the, the northern hemisphere for, for millions of years. So um, if we can look at our role in that as, as tipping it over to where beaver can take over and maintain that habitat, uh, that seems like a really promising place to focus. And so that's where I've transitioned in, in my thinking and in my work, trying to, trying to get to the place where uh, we have sites that look like this. This was a, uh, it's near me, it's in the Illinois Valley. This was a, a cattle pasture and uh, the creek had been diked across one side. It's on a pretty small um, stream, perennial stream, but about as small as perennial streams get. And the beaver punched a bunch of holes in the dike, uh, flooded the cattle pasture, and now we have you know, a three acre wetland, um, which is just pumping out baby fish. Sometimes landowners can't afford to have a three acre wetland though, so we'll get into that as well. First, I think it's useful to go through the various things beaver do on the landscape, if you, say, if you will, the uh, natural history of the animal themselves. Uh, when we think about beaver, there's, there's two structures that I first come to mind. The first is that classic lodge that, that emerges from the wetland. Um, the bigger picture here is the same wetland that I showed in the previous slide. And beavers will build a lodge in the context that uh, they've flooded, they've, they've so thoroughly flooded the habitat that they're uh, living in that there's no place for them to get up and out of the water um, that's safe. So, so if in the, in the context of a, a river, like the upper photo, photo uh, that's from the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho, you can see beaver have actually burrowed into the bank and then they've added some, some uh, woody material over the top of their den to probably uh, avoid predators digging in on them. So you'll see that. You'll either see a freestanding lodge in a wetland where they're trying to elevate themselves up out of the water and create a safe home, or they'll be burrowing into a bank. And oftentimes if they burn the bank, it's pretty cryptic. You know, the, the water, the entrance is underwater and they're usually up tucked in somewhere where it's, it's pretty hard to see them. The other structure they build, which is often not hard to see are of course the beaver dams. And the beaver dams uh, function to back up water and, and promote more, more watered habitat for the beaver themselves. So uh, beaver don't live in these dams, these are, these are Functionally mechanic, functioning mechanically to, to push water up and um, out onto the floodplain. <clears throat> and beaver will have both primary dams and secondary dams, which is kind of useful to think about. Uh, primary dams are the ones they care a lot about, where the water level behind that dam is regulating the water level at the entrance to their den. So in the sense that that dam breaches, the water level drops and their front door is open to, to potential predators. And then they'll build auxiliary dams out across the landscape where uh, they're looking to kind of increase their home range or where they can forage. 
Here's a picture of a bank den. Often the entrances are right behind that primary dam. So you can see in this photo, I'm looking down uh, into the pool that's resulting from this beaver dam. Um, this is in uh, the Beaverton area, or actually Forest Grove, so uh, similar part of the state. And uh, you can see their entrance is really quite right behind the primary dam. The small photo is what it looks like if you dip your head in the water. And the larger photo is what it looks like if you then crawl up inside the beaver den. So this was one I crawled up into, it's pretty cozy. It's uh, maybe, you know, four foot round, completely dug out, little nest of, of willow and reed canary grass. And uh, that's, what, that's what a beaver den looks like. Uh, unlike Nutria, they don't build extensive tunnel systems. It's usually relegated to a, a pretty simple den, sometimes a, a back entrance or an emergency exit. Because they are um, really great, really great food for a lot of animals. It's, uh, beaver are really graceful in water, but when they're out on land, they're, they're um, pretty slow moving 60 pounds of protein. So everything eats them. Wolves ate a lot of beaver uh, until we didn't have as many wolves. Uh, and cougars seem to be probably one of the biggest predators of beaver in our state, uh, aside from, of course, humans. Other beaver sign you'll see, uh, this is a, the bigger photo is one from West Lynn, and you can see the beaver are, are pretty habitual as to where they go forage out into the landscape. And so habitual, then at some point they decide to invest in these paths that they have and dig them out as canals. And so about where there's the, the stem that, that is in the picture next to the path, uh, you can see it, it, it actually gets deeper. It then, then becomes a 16 inch deep canal. And, so at established beaver sites, you'll often see this where, where you have fingerlings of canals stretching out across the landscape. And those are often full of water and, and also full of invertebrates and, and juvenile fish and everything else uh, because they, they're functionally very small side channels. <clears throat> and then of course, beaver chewed sticks. Uh, this is a feeding raft. Beaver will often uh, eat in the same place over and over again. So you can sometimes see these. Uh, this, an important thing to remember is um, beavers are, are vegetarian, uh, or I guess rather vegan. They eat primarily the cambium layer, which is the living tissue around uh, woody vegetation like trees and shrubs, but they also eat a lot of aquatic vegetation uh, and plants and grasses and forbs. And so sometimes folks don't know that they have a beaver issue. Uh, through the summer and spring when beaver are eating more of that herbaceous uh, forage. And then it's really just in this time of year when uh, plants are dormant that people notice all the cut sticks and chewing as beaver transition over to uh, more of a woody species diet. So despite uh, what, our, what our ODFNW has classified beaver as a predator, um, they, they are vegetarian. Also Narnia has promoted the myth that beaver eat fish, um, which I'm happy to dispel as well. So the result of those activities create wetlands, and that's when restoration practitioners and folks uh, charged with recovering really any species um, that would have been in and around water uh, before beaver were trapped out on mass gets very excited. And Biologists have, have this, this term keystone species that it's helpful for illustrating the point. Um, so you got the Roman arch and the, there's the, the stone at the very top that holds everything together and you pluck that out and the stone collapses. Well, across the landscape, you often have animals who drive um, habitat formation and, and function in a sense as that keystone for an entire ecosystem. So in the Great Plains, you have prairie dogs and buffalo, uh, you know, uh, in, in the kelp forests, you have uh, um, sea otter. And in wetlands, riparian areas, any, any aquatic habitat um, throughout North America and also the Northern Hemisphere at large, you have beaver. And, and because beaver are damming water and, and holding it back and sequestering it and creating these, these large wetlands, um, predictably, 
a bunch of other species have evolved to that niche. It's been a nice predictable niche across the landscape. And so we have everything from lamprey to trumpeter swans using some little piece of that niche. And of course, as, as beaver have um, left our landscape and the numbers that they have, uh, that habitat has disappeared and we've been left uh, sort of emulating little pieces of beaver habitat uh, with our restoration projects. Some of the early funders of beaver-based restoration were actually uh, Ducks Unlimited and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation because of the recognized increase in waterfowl uh, production and recognized increase in um, uh, big game uh, habitat as well. So, so it's not even just fish folks that get excited. Uh, and it's, it's really anybody who, who requires water to persist over the summertime because you've got, you've got water that's slowing down, that's uh, sinking into local water tables. On the east side of our state, you have ranchers who are starting to partner with beaver to bring back beaver into their sections of uh, their, their grazing allotments where they've been trucking in water recently over seasonal droughts. And beaver promise, you know, water later in the year. A lot of those streams look like this. They become incised. And you can see here incised, meaning uh, a ditch where it should be a braided, complex, healthy stream. And you can see here where um, the really recently freshly grown willow is coming up in red and doing so because there's a beaver dam there that's successfully pushing water back out onto a floodplain that hasn't been engaged recently. And so even just, you know, a 16 inch tall beaver dam, suddenly you've got uh, riparian growth uh, to a pretty large extent. And, and you can see the older desiccant willows up on the top there, that all used to be floodplain. And so really looking at this is, okay, how do we, how do we partner with beaver to help build um, ourselves out of these trenches, build, build streams out of these trenches? This is a chronic problem across the West. Here's another example uh, of folks out on the beaver site looking at what that looks like when, when indeed the beaver dam um, connects the two incised banks. And, it, and, and on the east side, you know, they have to turn green line and it really, it really grows that green line uh, for those water starved systems. But on the west side where sometimes we have too much water, uh, beavers also, their, their dams um, both help retain sediment uh, and increase water quality when we have big, big storm events. And they also help attenuate the hydrograph such that when you have a big flow event and you have a lot of water sluicing through a drainage, those beaver dams are acting as speed bumps and they're slowing it down and they're pushing it out into vegetation. And uh, you, can, you can attenuate the curve on, on sort of how extreme your high water gets. So there's uh, a new innovation folks have been working with, uh, beaver dam analogs. This is useful in the context of very incised streams where beaver actually can't even make a go of it because um, the velocity of the stream itself is too much. You know, one beaver can't make a stand and there isn't the, isn't the accumulation of beaver dams over uh, a reach to where the water has slowed down enough to where you know, all the pressures and on one dam. So take posts, we found them in the stream, we build our own version of beaver dams, and we hope that beavers come in and occupy those structures themselves eventually. I love mentioning this book because, uh, so, so the beaver, the bigger animal, there's a muskrat um, up in the left-hand corner of the photo. And this is probably the first instance of someone talking about uh, intentionally building beaver dam analogs, humans trying to play at beaver. This was a uh, trapper in the um, Canadian uh, backcountry who moved there with his family and, and moved to a pretty uh, dismal remnant wetland. It had been bent, burnt over by a wildfire. Uh, it had been completely trapped out of beaver. And he quickly realized that if he wanted to trap muskrat, and more importantly, if he wanted to trap coyotes who feed on muskrat, he needed to emulate what beavers would have been doing with that level. And so him and his son, Beezy, uh, spent years building beaver dams and they successfully got muskrat back in the area and they successfully were trapping coyotes that were feeding on the muskrat. And eventually he persuaded the Canadian government to give him a couple of beaver and got beaver in there. 
was able to take a step back and uh, stop uh, attending to the dams every time there was, a, there was a water event. And if you think about what this context or what this landscape looks looked like in the context of beaver, it's really hard to overstate. Many of the early maps would show streams like this, uh, rather than a single thread channel like you would see in a, in a fly fishing catalog. Um, they, were, they were these necklaces of beaver ponds. And even more than necklaces, they were, they were braids, they were, they were messy fingers. Um, these, were, these were valley bottoms that were flat because the sediment was dropping out equally because there was water. So, you know, floodplains were, were connected um, and they were, they were connected fully through beaver and their work, which made it hard to navigate these areas. But then as you drain uh, these wetlands, all that accumulated sediment from millions of years of, of beaver dams uh, led to the, the, fertile, the fertile soils that we're, we're still farming. And of course, then beaver were seen as, as a resource. So uh, this area was uh, trapped out pretty extensively. Beaver were seen as the currency of the land. This, uh, this top hat, uh, the classic Abe Lincoln top hat was in vogue and beaver fur when felted keeps water out very nicely and um, doesn't lose its shape. You know, if you, if you felt a hat with rabbit fur, um, it'll eventually lose its shape, but, but beaver holds up well in the weather. And so beaver were worth a lot and they really drove Western expansion. They were a geopolitical um, bartering tool and, and they were bartering tool at the very uh, most local levels too. These are, um, uh, currency tokens from the Hudson Bay Company, Made Beaver, MB stands for Made Beaver, and uh, beaver were really the first gold standard, if you will. There was a beaver standard, and you would trade in five fleshed out uh, dried hides. That would be, that's, that's what made means. You've put work into them uh, for one of these tokens with which you can shop at the company store. So uh, that's how beaver were pretty effectively wiped from North America. This fellow didn't help. Peter Skin Ogden, he was working for the Hudson Bay Company at the time. He killed two Native American folk up at um, present day Seattle. And he was looking to skip trial before uh, he got in trouble for their murder. So the company had a job for him and they sent him down south to create a quote unquote fur desert uh, through from the Snake River through to the coast. And the idea was as as the American trappers are pushing up north from California, the French trappers, the Hudson Bay Company, wanted to create a buffer um, to where those, those Americans would get to an area that was completely devoid of pelts and they would see that there was nothing for them there and they would turn around and go home. So this fellow who kind of looks like a toad went through most of um, Oregon and, and parts of other Western states too, creating a fur desert. And when he got to my area, he was camped at a pass um, near Pleasant Day, Klamath Falls, and, and observing a, tri uh, a war between two of the, the local tribes. And he wrote in his journal that night, uh, may they destroy each other, the more the better. If they are fond of war, let them enjoy it. And we, in the meantime, will endeavor to wage war on their beaver. And that was definitely the sentiment. Uh, he was the first white guy through this area, and it was that, it was that first push through, uh, a, a very myopic focus on on beaver. And beaver didn't do any better in Europe. So uh, beaver accumulate salicylic acid in their glands. Uh, salicylic acid being uh, a heavy component of, of willow bark. And it's also uh, analogous to present day aspirin. So uh, these glands were worth a lot of money. Um, one gland was worth a year's wages uh, for a medieval uh, laborer. And beaver have two. And then not only that, but the, the animal's body itself was worth a third year wages. The Catholic Church deems that because beaver have scales and they swim in the water, they um, are indeed a fish. And so uh, as a fish, you could eat them on Catholic holidays where red meat was otherwise forbidden. So the bodies of beaver and beaver meat were valued by the, by the wealthy looking to eat red meat on those holidays as were the um, the glands. And so beaver were pretty much extirpated through most of Europe. And, and folks have really forgotten how great beaver hides were 
uh, until they got here and, and remembered or re rediscovered. And that's a pile of beaver hides. This was, uh, this was big business. Beaver were a natural resource to be extracted. And in a sense, um, that's how they were seen for a long time uh, until fur markets crashed, uh, you know, focus shifted elsewhere. You know, we focused on, on gold on, in this corner of the, of the Northern Hemisphere and we, and we focused on extracting timber and beaver became a, a nuisance. They really were then relegated to this animal that will plug a road culvert or chew down ornamental trees. And they've been a nuisance more or less for the last 150 years. And it's only recently, uh, maybe in the last 20 or more, that, that on a broad level, they're starting to be again accepted as a natural resource. Um, perhaps this time though, uh, as one to be retained on the landscape for the benefits that they create. So Tiffany, let's put up our second poll uh, before I get into conflicts with beaver. And I'm just curious, uh, beaver can be a pain in the butt. So I'm curious if any folks have had that experience or they've, they've worked to uh, try to outsmart beaver. All right, last five seconds to vote. Cool. So it looks like there's some folks struggling with beaver issues and could you use a hand? Um, that's great. And it looks like we've also got some folks who could lend a hand. So uh, I'll show my contact information at the end of this presentation. But feel free to get a hold of me and the Beaver Coalition or um, Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Your local watershed council is a really great resource when, when talking beaver. And then of course, it looks like the majority have seen some beaver sign and some folks don't know where to find beaver. Again, uh, the watershed council would be a great, a great first start. Okay, thank you, Tiffany. Um, so let's move into conflicts with beaver. This is what gets most beaver killed in our state currently. And everything they do is pretty solvable. So um, of course, famously, they cut down trees and we'll start with that. Um, not only do they cut down trees though too, they also flood out trees. So often in streams where there haven't been beaver for a long time, the stream is degraded and it's sized into a ditch you get conifers growing along the sides of that ditch and in the flat areas that used to be wetland. And as beaver reconnect those, those banks, that, that historic floodplain, uh, those conifers don't like it and, and they'll drown. So if you're looking to help folks with beaver issues, that's, that's um, an important piece. And it's, it's readily solvable um, from a cutting tree perspective. It's important to remember that most riparian vegetate, all riparian vegetation that's native uh, came into being co-evolved uh, with beaver cutting it. So, so they've got sort of a relationship and a conversation going on and they've, uh, those species that, that are used to beaver um, in some contexts depend on, on this uh, regular cutting or, or coppicing and um, come back even more vigorous. So this is a cottonwood sapling that had been cut previous year and you can see all the re-sprouts growing off of it. Problem is ornamental trees that we plant or fruit trees or trees we really care about don't have that coppicing behavior. You've got coppicing behavior in trees that evolved two places, uh, beaver, so sh streamside trees, trees that were adjacent to wetlands, and, and fire, so trees that were in the, in the uplands and, and subject to regular fire like oak 
and Madrone, uh, also independently evolved the ability to compass. But beavers love apples too, and, and apples are dead dead as soon as they're cut down. Same with uh, ornamental Japanese maple. And a lot of beaver conflicts are folks who have moved to waterfront properties and they've got those ornamental trees or those trees they really care about that don't come from the wildlands of this state and so don't have coppicing uh, behavior. And in that context, we need to protect those trees. There's two ways to do that. The first way, very effective, is using wel welded wire. Uh, don't use chicken wire. These are 60 pound animals. If they put their front paws up on chicken wire, they'll smash it down, easily get to your tree. And there's some sort of uh, rules of thumb, at least 30 inches high, uh, plus any higher if, we, if you get snow. Uh, not as relevant to the larger Portland area, but uh, in some areas, this is, this is really important. You you'll build all your cages and then the snow comes and the beaver come in and lock the area um, above the cages. And then leaving room to grow, uh, I see so many trees that were protected by you know, the watershed council or local residents 15 years prior. And then whoever that was lost track or moved away or no longer works for that group and the tree was forgotten. And now it's girdled and dead because of the wire, not the beaver. So uh, leaving adequate room to grow and, and realizing that this is something you're gonna have to go back and look at and maintain. And be sure to protect the root collar. You can see on this one how they've, how they've flared the fencing out at the end. Uh, if, if you just have the column of fencing resting on the roots, the beaver can girdle a tree on the roots too, or they'll dig in a little bit. They won't dig dig after a tree, but um, you do want to dissuade them from those roots. Here's a couple gone wrong. The first one is at Fenno uh, Creek uh, near, near where I think a lot of folks are tuning in from. And you can see here there was a chicken wire <laughs> uh, cage put around a red cedar with T posts and the tree grew large enough to where um, it grew into the T posts. And then a beaver came along and smashed the chicken wire down and tried to chew it down and then uh, got to the place that was reinforced by steel and gave up and now you have this teetering epic um, hazard tree right next to a bike path. So <laughs> that's one thing to watch. Uh, and then another thing to watch is using material that's too big. Uh, here's another one where uh, the tree was protected with cattle fencing. So four by four openings and the beaver just chewed a perfect four by four hole in every single opening all the way around. And they didn't fell the tree, but they, they effectively girdled it. Another way to protect trees, sand and paint. And this is probably my favorite. Um, again, you need to do maintenance. You need to uh, repaint it occasionally, but the basic theory on this is that uh, by mixing sand into latex paint and painting that in, on the tree, we can create sort of a rubberized sandpaper as beavers bite into that, they hate the feeling on their teeth and, and it dissuades them. So that's roughly the formula, five ounces of sand to a quart of paint. Uh, I like to buy paint from my local paint store that's, that's a reject, you know, that somebody didn't get the color right. And uh, again, sort of here's the, the main principles of doing that. An important piece to note, doesn't work on saplings. So anything where you know, one or two bites and the beaver's through and the tree's down, uh, it, it's, you're not gonna be effective because they're gonna not like the taste but they will have already cut down your tree. And you can also match the tree's color. So here's a couple where folks didn't really care about the color. Um, these are uh, trees I've seen out on sites. And here's where folks really did care about the color. So the tree to your left, the one with the yellow or the orange flagging has been painted and the one to the right hasn't. And so you can get really, really creative about color matching and come in with black highlights and the whole bit and uh, effectively disappear the, the sanded paint um, application from the landscape. So it's really uh, aesthetic choice at that point, but it looks really nice uh, when you take the time to do it. Uh, last piece I'll mention on protecting vegetation is that beavers eat orchards and crops too. Uh, so I was talking to a fellow in Germany and he talked about how sugar beets were the favorite for beaver. They don't have a lot of riparian vegetation, but they have a lot of sugar beet fields. So 
beavers would go in and just uh, annihilate these, these sections of sugar beet field. Uh, I've been out to a number of orchards in, in our state where beaver are chewing down trees. And there's a really easy solution to this. You could go through and protect every tree adjacent to the stream. Totally works. Uh, but another option is electrical fencing. Beaver are coming out of the water. They're soaking wet. They're low to the ground. They're in areas where they've borne most of the vegetation off the ground, so they're well grounded. And they're the perfect candidate for a little um, solar electric fence setup, you know, something you, you would buy from the local Wilco or, uh, or farmer supply store. And guidelines for this, two bare wires, six and 10 inches off the ground. Big thing here, gotta maintain vegetation growth under the wires. So um, for conventional operations uh, that are doing spraying near the creek anyway, sometimes they'll spray at the, at the um, fence, other folks, Know, have somebody go through with a weed whacker, um, but it's a fire danger and it also ground out your, your fence and make it ineffective. You can get a bunch of grass growing up into it. Do so docking and maintenance um, commitment, but it's highly effective. So if we set aside vegetation, the other place you will see beaver conflicts is with uh, flooding. Beaver are damming things and flooding things, and we have built a lot of things near where they want to flood. So a classic is a road culvert. If you're, if you're a beaver looking at a stream as it enters a road culvert, that looks like people have built a pretty effective dam and they left one hole in the surface of the dam. So when beaver come in and they plug the hole and it results in a wetland, uh, humans get really, really up in a, a fit about it. And it's not only just culverts for adjacent infrastructure like roads or buildings. This was a a site I walked um, out Beaverton area again, and uh, was flooding about six acres of fescue crop. So the farmer and the landowner were pretty unhappy about losing six acres of fescue. So we've got a set of tools uh, for this as well called flow devices. There's three main types. Uh, this is your toolkit, if you will. The first type is the pond leveler. And this works uh, to level or, or to create a maximum height for a beaver impoundment. So if you've got a dam and it's okay at some level, but it's not okay at another level, you can, you can put it in a flexible pond leveler. Here's a cross section of what they look like. Um, more or less a pipe that you put over the dam at the level you want to control it at, and then it runs out to a cage. And this is actually an old drawing. We'll get into some of the best management practices, but uh, no longer recommending a one-way fish store out of the pipe. But the premise is the same. So you, so you then have a cage around the intake and beaver, if you notch their dam, they'll obsess over the front of their dam and they'll quickly find your notch and, and build it back. However, if you hide that leak out in the body of the pond, beaver aren't really looking for a leak in the body of their pond. And then if you exclude beaver from the area where they might sense that leak with a cage, in this case, often uh, three feet radius, so six feet in diameter. Uh, you'll keep them from ever sensing, oh, there's a leak there. You know, they won't feel it through their whiskers and, and it can quietly operate. And it's like a uh, um, overflow on your bathtub where water reaches a certain level and it doesn't go any higher. And the beaver won't build the dam any higher either because uh, they don't generally build up into air if it's not effectively vacuumed. Another strategy uh, for protecting culverts, you've got the pipe and fence and you've got the trapezoidal uh, culvert fence. So let's take the trapezoidal culvert fence first. This works in an area where you've got water upstream of the culvert and you're trying to keep beaver from plugging the culvert. And beaver, it, it works off the premise that beaver cue off the sound of trickling water for uh, that, that, that kind of causes the damning behavior. And we've done a couple experiments where, you know, you can put a battery, battery operated boom box on the side of a beaver wetland and play, you know, white fountain noise. And then come back the next morning and there's half a ton of mud rammed and packed over the boom box, um, <laughs> obsessively trying to control that sound. And so working off of that, what this does is it, is it uh, directs the beaver damming activity away from the sound of the culvert. So you're building a trapezoid of fencing, you're putting a bottom on it. And as the beaver 
start damming where they can hear things at the culvert, um, they get further and further away from that queue and it diminishes and pretty soon they're out in slack water, there's no reason to dam. And you still meanwhile have the whole front of that flow device facilitating water through your culvert. Uh, another version, which is kind of the child between a trapezoidal fence and a pond leveler. You install a pond leveler into, into a fence that you build around a culvert. And this is in the context of, well, we, we want the beaver to be able to dam something here. Maybe there's uh, value to the habitat being dammed, but we can't have it in the, in the culvert itself. So you can create an armature, if you will, with fencing and uh, beaver dam against that, and then you can insert a pond level leveler if need be at whatever level you want to control that at. Here's a couple thick pictures. Here's a, a trapezoidal uh, culvert fence. And here's one with wildlife passage. This is an important concept. Uh, the uh, fellow I learned from Mike Callahan started doing these and now I do them on any device I build where uh, if you have anything moving upstream in the culvert, uh, terrestrial animal like a, uh, an otter or a beaver themselves, uh, they'll come into this and they'll make their way around and then they'll find the opening up onto dry land and they can get out without trying to squeeze through. And, and uh, this is a pretty important thing. You can put a game cam in any of these and, and get a lot of wildlife activity through. Um, and we'll talk about fish passage in a little bit. Here's a picture of you know where the beaver have dammed around a culvert fence and you're controlling the level. So important things to consider for any of this stuff. Uh, tree protection, again, making sure your electrical fence is grounded. Flow devices, uh, fish passage. It, so a lot of these were developed in the East Coast where the Atlantic salmon is mostly extinct from a lot of its historic range. Um, so as we move these out West, we've had to have a much more nuanced conversation around how are fish going to um, move around these devices, how are we potentially artificially impacting natural fish passage of beaver dams by implementing these devices. So uh, the Beaver Coalition and uh, ODFNW Fish Passage are in an ongoing conversation about that. We're going to be issuing best management practices. Uh, in in um, that, that process, we'll also we'll, we'll work with NOAA too, uh, and then we'll be issuing best management practices for building these things in salmon country. Until that point, it's important to get a hold of your local biologists. And you know, some sites there's not a lot of fish distribution. Some sites the fish are pretty small and it doesn't matter. And some sites you've got big enough moving through, and everybody needs to be really careful. So um, that said, uh, the next thing to consider: there is precedent for being held liable for flooding if you alter a beaver dam. Uh, so there was a case in Washington State where an upstream landowner didn't like the beaver dam, decided to notch it. Big storm came in, uh, beaver dam failed and took out much of the downstream neighbor's living room. And so upstream neighbor who did the notching was held liable for downstream neighbor's living room repairs. And the argument that went out was that you basically destabilized an otherwise stable or at least natural uh, system. So by humans going in and doing something, you know, we, we bear the, the liability. So there is a little bit of case law on that. And I just like to point that out. If you're getting into putting in flow devices, it's something to consider. Uh, but also breaching beaver dams, actually the, the case law is more applicable to that. So it's one of those things you want to be really careful. And uh, when you do it, and make sure you've talked to folks who might have something to say about it uh, on the agency side. Lethal removal is still currently legal um, on private land as a predator. Uh, you, can, you can kill beaver at, at will. Um, you don't have to tell anyone about it. You can kill mamas when babies are in the den. It's, it's, uh, uh, there's, there's no protections. Um, on federal land, they're a fur bearer. And that means that there's a season. Uh, there's no bag limits. Um, but uh, there is a season and, and beaver can be trapped off public land um, recreationally. Um, lethal removal has been the tool that everyone has used in the past for these conflicts. And so what you end up with is um, sites where every year people are trapping beaver off because they're good beaver habitat and new beaver will move into that habitat. Beaver are um, territorial, so they seem to mate for life. They'll, they'll 
live in a territory um, for a really long time and, and it seems even pass that territory down through generations. So when you take a family out of an area, um, you're gonna get teenagers that are looking for a new territory uh, moving into that area. Beaver kits will stay for a whole year after they grow up, so two years, um, and help with the young of the year. And they move off as teenagers after, after two years at home. So when we talk about a beaver colony, we're talking about usually the two parents and then um, some cohort of teenagers and some cohort of young of the year beaver. So when, you, when we think about beaver trapping, either uh, kill trapping or, or relocating beaver, it really doesn't matter. It's important to realize you're just buying time. Uh, another beaver family will, will move in. And the other thing you're doing is you're creating a suck, uh, a black hole, a sink in, in the population um, of beaver in that area. So if you've got a site where you're continually removing beaver, um, you're gonna be draining the adjacent areas of beaver uh, because beaver will go to the site that's, that's the best habitat. And if, if we don't work on coexistence in those places first, um, those are really effective at drawing down the landscape of beaver. So the last bit here, just talking about uh, strategic planning. Uh, this is for those folks who have uh, dipped their toes into this realm a little bit. Now we understand beaver behavior. We've talked about the solution toolkit. And so those are the, those are the two pieces that you need to then go to a site and put together a management plan, an adaptive management plan. And I'll just run you through a little exercise here. Uh, Fennel Park, uh, these are pictures I took a number of years ago, or maybe it's all Google Earth stuff, but they've had beaver for, for a while and they've been working with them. And it's a good example of an urban system. So you can see Fennel Park stretching through there and you've got big boxes on one side and small boxes on the other. And the day I walked, uh, let's focus on this beaver dam. Um, so here we've got a beaver dam where the yellow arrow is and you can see it's flooding the bike path. You can see the, the carefully engineered curve of the stream sort of ghosts under that wetland. Um, that, is, uh, that is how those of us in restoration um, have seen uh, healthy streams. And so we've been designing sites with curves, when in reality sites were probably more graded, uh, anastomatosing, just complex uh, wetted systems. And so in this case, the beaver came in and they disrupted the curve, flooded out a bunch of plantings and flooded a bike path. So you can see the impoundment uh, flow is moving um, downstream toward the arrow that's pointing at the beaver dam. So this is the result of impoundment. And in this case, if you put in a flow device, you can drop your impoundment such that the bike path is open, right? So these beaver don't need to be relocated. If you were going to go in and notch this dam, uh, they probably build it back up to flood the bike path again uh, in a couple days. But you can put in more of a long-term coexistence solution and get it to the point where you still have functional habitat and the human infrastructure is preserved. So that's, that's where these are most applicable. The important thing to remember from a habitat point of view is we are artificially diminishing the amount of good habitat beaver are creating, but, but it's a uh, weighing human priorities and uh, natural resource priorities. You know, there's, there's often a happy middle where uh, there's still enough for the beaver and, and we can have our infrastructure. Important things to consider when you're working with folks on a predictive management plan, identifying trees that don't coppice versus trees that do coppice and not obsessively protecting every willow tree that is just fine with beaver cutting it. Uh, and also thinking about, are there, is there enough forage for beaver if we protect the trees people care about? Sometimes there's not, and it, it makes sense to do a willow planting. You know, you can, you can take uh, cuttings of willow and just shove them in the ground on the water line and they start sprouting uh, more or less immediately. So sometimes we can augment with trees we care less about the beaver cutting uh, to try to help build a buffer, a beaver buffer, if you will, for the trees that we do care about. Also important to think, about what tree protection looks like and which trees um, are there priority trees that can drown. Don't forget to think about drowning trees too because um, that's an important piece. Dams, try to consider if the dam you're looking at is an auxiliary dam or a primary dam. 
Is it, is it backing up water for, for an entrance that you were care about? If you can find that entrance, great, because then you can look at how much freeboard do you have to play with, right? How much water above the top curve of that den entrance do you have? And that will help dictate, okay, if we put in the pond leveler, um, how much can we drop it down before we destabilize the situation? If you, if you get greedy and you drop it all the way to the floor of the creek, or if you drop it past uh, the den entrance, then, then often the beaver will just build a new dam. Thinking about impoundment, footprints we can tolerate, really it's a give and take, but as much as you can give, the more likely your flow device is to be successful in the long run. And can we suggest a better dam location? So in, in uh, the northern part of our state, uh, there's a lot of drain tile in fields, uh, historic beaver wetlands, right? While they're still very wet and they're still very fertile, so um, these drain tiles help facilitate water movement into the stream to get it out of there so that other crops can grow. And uh, sometimes, you know, if a beaver dam is just downstream of a drain tile, for example, you can move it just upstream from a drain tile. And that can be done by just completely removing the beaver dam one day and building your shoddy impression of a beaver dam where you'd like it. And usually the beaver will be embarrassed by whatever you did. They'll come and improve it and, and you've moved the beaver dam successfully. It doesn't work to move a dam from down, a primary dam from downstream of a tunnel entrance to upstream of a tunnel entrance, obviously. Um, but it's another tool. And in wrapping, I would just close with a, a little story from my neck of the woods. So this is Thompson Creek. This is the creek I grew up on. Uh, this is actually a restoration project, although you can't tell it because of all the blackberries that I was working on a number of years ago. And beaver moved into the area. We were very excited. So Thompson Creek, I grew up swimming in Thompson Creek uh, as a kid in the 90s. It was cold, deep water. And I remember uh, really dragging my feet as I walked across the cattle pasture to get to our to get to our creek because uh, I want to be really hot before I jumped in. Uh, and now my kids play with, uh, with dry rocks every summer. There, there is no Thompson Creek in the summer. And it's because our snowpack has changed, um, maybe a little bit about uh, how usage in the creek has changed too, but, but really it seems to be that you know, the mountains we, we used to see snow on deep into the summer hardly ever have snow on them at all. And we get the same amount of rain, but it comes early or it comes late and all at once. Uh, so beaver promise a lot here and um, we were really excited to see this dam show up. Uh, as I said, the creek then started going dry in the summer and it first went dry uh, upstream of this pond. But for a couple weeks, uh, close to three weeks, there was still water moving out of the base of the beaver dam. So, so even though um, there was no input, um, you know, above surface input that we could see, there was still surface water uh, coming out. And then eventually that surface water petered out and you were left with just this, this island of, of um, water. And it was like a African Serengeti water hole. Like all the wildlife was there every day. It was the one spot to get water. It was of course full of coho and every other fish that had successfully found that one spot as the creek was drying up. And it lasted close to another month just in that condition uh, before it too dried up and the beaver bailed on Thompson Creek. So I think that really holds some of the promise that beaver have. If you think about this in the context of, well, you know, what if there had been another beaver dam just upstream that had been feeding water into this one and one does downstream catching that water? You know, you can see how groundwater recharge at these at these individual sites could then facilitate a stream staying wet uh, year round. So with that, I'll close. Here's my contact information. I, uh, I have both a private business and I worked in the restoration field for a long time, but um, I'm really excited to be pivoting now to a nonprofit that I co-founded uh, called the Beaver Coalition. And um, Rob Walton, who's in your area, who I mentioned at the beginning, was, was the other co-founder. We uh, were really excited to try to, to dig in on addressing limiting factors for folks trying to work with beaver, uh, doing some effective education on, on scale for beaver, and helping, helping those who are interested in, in, in partnering with beaver.
or do so effectively. So feel free to reach out, visit our website. Um, I, I'll shamelessly plug it's the end of the year for a nonprofit and a donor has offered to double match or our double uh, donation. So if you give to nonprofits at the end of the year, that's an opportunity too. Uh, and with that, let's open it up for questions. Great. So for folks who are on Zoom, if you want to go ahead and put some questions in the Q&A box, if you're on Facebook, you can put that in the comments. We're going to, looks like we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Jacob, for going through this presentation. I learned a lot. And at Johnson Creek, we actually do a great deal of beaver surveys, and I'm fairly knowledgeable. And I feel like that was a whole new world of uh, beaver management. So thanks so much. Just want to start with that. But yeah, for folks, um, for questions, I'm going to go ahead and look through here. Um, great. Okay, I see one question from Michelle. How long do beavers stay in one area once their dams have been built? Uh, that's a good question. It seems to be contingent on how much food is there. So in the context of an eastern organ stream where maybe uh, plants don't bounce back quite as fast or you've got less forage. Sometimes you see beavers in a place for a couple of years and then they move out or even just a summer and then they move out. Um, but that's usually relating to a stream that's on its way back to recovery. So they'll build some dams, they'll access what uh, forage they can and then they'll bounce and then, you know, that dam will still be there um, and you'll get more willow recruitment and maybe they're back. So sometimes there's an iterative uh, cycle to getting back to a uh, complex braided floodplain with a lot of food. But their density seems really dependent on uh, how close to get or how much forage you can get laterally from the stream. It's really hard to measure sort of beaver home ranges. You know, do you measure them in acres? Do you measure them in stream length? And it, and it seems to be you can measure it in food. Thanks for answering that one. Um, Another question someone asked is, what funding is available for landowners to implement some of these solutions? Yeah, good question. Uh, so down where I'm at in the Rogue and Umpqua, Beaver Coalition has a small grant to help folks with uh, putting in non-lethal solutions. We also recently received a grant from NRCS to help folks put in uh, a number of uh, flow devices in the context of uh, trying them on working lands. So if uh, we're, we're actually currently looking for a couple of good examples of um, farms or ranches that are struggling with beaver issues, producers, and part of the deal there is then we get to film the story and build a little case study out of it to share. So there's a couple little opportunities like that. Uh, I've really seen small grants be effective through OWEB for funding these kind of things or small foundation grants. Generally speaking, a pond leveler, you know, if I go do a pond leveler for somebody uh, for my private business, it's uh, about 3,500 bucks. Um, so that's very fundable often in, in small grant chunks if you work with your local watershed council. I know that some of the SWCDs in your area have, have funded uh, pond levelers, I know the Metropolitan SWC specifically. Uh, so, I'd say reach out to the folks that are interested in the habitat the beaver are creating, and often they'll help you find money to retain that habitat if the beaver are causing issues. And it's something that needs to be worked on more, I'm hoping, with the Beaver Coalition. One of the things we're hoping to do is facilitate training up first responder um, teams around the state and around uh, the country that, uh, you know, maybe there's, there's a couple key players who have training all the way through flow device installation. Um, and, then a, and then a volunteer team that can go respond, that have sort of access to the best available techniques. And, um, and then we'll be able to work on a funding program for those folks to effectively implement um, projects with landowners who can't afford to, uh, to do it themselves. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is, are you working with indigenous folks? Um, what kind of plans do you have to work with indigenous communities? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of the indigenous um, communities in salmon country have really led this effort. Uh, so um, the Tualap up in kind of above Seattle area, uh, in my neck of the woods, the Cow Creek Band of Uncle Tribe of Indians, 
have hosted the uh, one of the premier international beaver conferences uh, for many years called State of the Beaver. It would be happening this January or February, uh, but for COVID. But in Little Tiller, Oregon, um, at that tribe's casino, there's the international conference for folks doing this work. And, and there's usually a large contingent that comes in from Europe and from Canada. And then recently, um, some folks on the east side of our, our country uh, in Baltimore put on a East Coast Beaver Conference. So there's sort of two conferences and, and the, the one that we're putting on in the Pacific Northwest is, is fully facilitated. Well, it's housed within the tribe, um, the tribe's infrastructure. As far as the Beaver Coalition, we are looking to figure out how best effectively to bring in kind of that traditional um, ecological knowledge and and our mission is to empower humans to partner with beaver. Um, and so I think, I think there's a lot of promise there. Uh, we don't have anything developed yet, um, but that's one of, the, one of the spots that we're only going to be successful if, if all the communities are on board with this. And we have a lot to learn from the tribes. Thank you. Yeah, the next question. Um, do you help organizations develop management plans across a watershed or a city in some of those larger areas? Yeah, totally. Uh, we actually have two projects right now through the Beaver Coalition. We're putting together a beaver management plan for the Rogue River City National Forest, um, so a, a forest service district. And we're also working with BLM to put uh, together a beaver-based restoration plan for the Cascade City National Monument. So. Uh, we work at that level, um, and uh, my hope is to, at some point, help facilitate uh, other folks to be, you know, working with their local uh, groups to, to do that planning. Um, but until, until that, we're happily stepping in that role. Um, so, yeah, if you've got, if you've got a, uh, some geographic focus that you want to strategically talk, um, beaver management, reach out. Great. And the next one, we've got a lot of questions, so I might just do one or two more, Jacob, because I don't want to take up too much time. Yep. Um, the next one, are there any public outreach materials available to educate landowners about the benefits of beaver? Um, this person's saying it can be a difficult balance when agencies are working with landowners. I don't know if you have any of those types of materials already produced. Yeah, it's totally a difficult balance. Uh, I mean, speaking as a rural landowner, you're really reluctant to invite an agency out on your property. You know, what if they look over at my porch and notice there's no railings? There's this, there's this feeling of like, you know, I'm sure everything's not perfectly permitted. And do I really want the state on my property? And uh, so I think that's where working with uh, uh, non-regulatory folks like, like our NGO or like watershed councils is, is um, really a good partnership because the regulatory agencies can partner with those NGOs and then those NGOs can be building trust with landowners. Uh, as far as educational materials, um, there's, there's some stuff put out by the agency. So uh, State of Oregon has a Living with Beaver page. Um, the uh, NOAA just recently did a, did a little pamphlet that talks about the benefits of beaver. And then I guess um, what I would point to is probably the most exciting resource is the Beaver Restoration Guidebook. So that's uh, a compendium of the best available science and techniques for living with beaver and benefits of beaver. And it was put together in 2017 by a group of scientists and um, that group has recently uh, handed off uh, maintenance and stewardship of that document to the Beaver Coalition. So we're going to be maintaining that as a best available uh, science, but also, uh, you know, techniques for outsmarting beaver and, and benefits of beaver. That would be a good thing to go to. It's, it's on our website currently, and we're, we're in the process of planning the revision. And then as far as other outreach material, uh, you know, there, there's a whole great bag. There's a lot of organizations working with beaver, and they've all done really excellent work. Um, so I don't know uh, if, with the Beaver Coalition, we're pretty new. We're, uh, in existence as of March. And, and as we start to delve into those specific areas, um, we're going to maybe uh, elevate some of the best material we're seeing rather than doing our own and do our own uh, where we don't see something available. So the one thing we're working on right now, like I mentioned earlier, is those case studies. Uh, they're they're going to be small video vignettes. Sarah 
Koningsberg, who's the director of Beaver Believers. She's on our board. And she'll be producing these three to five minute um, case studies of rural landowners partnering with Beaver. So that I think will be our first uh, education um, contribution, uh, but there's, there's a lot of materials out there. That's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, last question. How does the presence of nutria affect the density of a beaver population? This is something I've also wondered about. Totally, and I actually don't know the, the answer to that. Um, so it's a good last question to end on. Uh, they seem to not really care about each other, I guess is the, the easy answer. You'll see beaver, I mean, beaver are very territorial and they're protecting their resources and they don't seem to care at all if there's a bunch of nutrients swimming around in my pond. Same with muskrat, you know, and, and you'll actually see muskrat sometimes in a beaver lodge with them. Um, the beaver just completely pretend like they're not there. So it's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think nutria and beaver are, uh, there's a limiting factor that they're both comp competing for, or if there is, beaver haven't recognized that yet because they'd be trying to kick nutria out if that were so. Um, a lot of beaver die because of nutria. So nutria are causing all sorts of problems with tunneling. Um, and they also move a lot of dirt around too. And so, uh, you know, beaver get blamed for nutria, uh, nutria impact. But other than that, it seems like they, it's kind of an ambivalent relationship. That's great. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. Okay, so I just wanted to give a quick reminder. If you're looking at places like you want the link to donate, um, you want to find out how to follow up, I'm going to actually send out an email tomorrow with this recording. Uh, links for donating to the Beaver Coalition and all the same information you see on the screen right here. So if someone asked me that question, I wanted to share that. If you're on Facebook in the comments, that should be posted there, the same links. Um, and I just want to follow up and just kind of say for anyone who's interested in learning more, there was a lot of questions we weren't able to get to today. Please feel free to look at the Beaver Coalition's website. They do incredible work. I think they fill a really key niche in the nonprofit sector. Um, helping people find a solution to working with beaver that's long-term, that works with the landscape and creates a better future for everyone. So I just wanna say, cannot praise their work highly enough. Thank you so much, Jacob, for coming on today um, and for all the work that you do with the Beaver Coalition and all of your colleagues. So yeah, thank you. Uh, feel free folks to reach out and next month, keep tuned for the, the continuation of the webinar series. We're excited to learn about more topics. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.